precious God. Hmm. This is just the beginning of it because the Lord is set to do some things to this weekend. And I pray that our heart be hoping to receive in the name of the Lord Jesus. Without taking much of our time, we're going into the word. The worship has set the pace. And then the word is coming with power. Please open your heart to receive. To receive. We've just entered into his presence in the place of worship. His presence always abides with us. But tonight we receive a new dimension of him through worship. And another set of another dimension of the Lord will be shown to us today in his word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God is a God of dimensions. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, it says, I, I show myself, I appear to Abraham as the as uh, the Lord Almighty. He said, But unto him, they don't know me as Jehovah. I pray to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the Lord Almighty. The book of Exodus chapter 3, 6, verse 3. But Abraham will go into his grave. Uh, Isaac and Jacob will go to their grave believing that, oh, we know a lot about this God. But was said to Moses, I want to show to you a different dimension of me as the Almighty. I pray that tonight the Lord will reveal himself to us in a different dimension. And this revelation will cause us to arise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, please join me as we welcome that man of God that's going to be ministering to us tonight, Pastor Shekun Olubemi. Let's just put our hands together, worship the, worship the Lord, and appreciate the man of God. Good evening, please. You may be seated. Thank you for having me here. It's been a little while. And um, thank you, Pastor, for... Um, for asking me to be here for this anniversary I celebrate with you on your 11th anniversary Amen, Amen. Hey, I'm seeing some old faces here uh, It's interesting because You know, when you, when you get into numerology You know, a lot of people do a lot of things with that But one of the things you will learn from numbers Is that it brings us to specific points of knowing what we need to do. Um, the number 10 is the number of work and work. You know, you have 10 toes, you have 10 fingers. So it represents your work and your work. And that's the number of the 10 commandments, you know. Um, and it's the number of labor. The problem with Abraham's negotiation with God was that he asked if there were 10 people. You will never find 10. You only find one. You understand what I'm saying? You can't find 10. It's only one person that can pay the price. That is the man Christ Jesus. Amen? And then when you get into your 11th, you restart the cycle again because our numeral system will go 1 to 10. It's just 11 is just starting over again. And if I were in your shoes and I'm partaking in the 11th anniversary of um, an organization, I know that the 11th season means that I can look forward to something fresh, something new. Amen. Amen. And uh, so that's the dimension I want to bring to us today, especially when we are focusing on the word arise as the set team or the word that God has given to um, the set man of the house, that this season we need to arise. And to that extent, we will look at this prophetic significance of that word arise see what the Lord is saying to you and then bring it into the realm of you know into the realm of practicable principles so that you can resonate at God's frequency because the other time Jesus was teaching us to pray he says when you ask say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name your will be what done on earth as it is what in other words everything is already done in heaven our job on earth is to align with the finished work in heaven and make it happen here amen, amen. so thank you for having me and let's get into the word isaiah chapter 60 very familiar passage isaiah chapter 60 
Thank you, Pastor, for um, I will say one, one or two things tomorrow. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, let's read verses 1 and 2. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Amen? Amen. Can I hear louder? Amen? Amen. There are, you know, there are things you need to, to learn whenever you are dealing with the scriptures. See, this Bible you, you read can be an open book if you work closely with the author, the one that inspired it, the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's not as clean, as clear as you think it is. Because he says so many things in coded language. So God is spirit. We know that. Okay, if you don't remember that, you remember in chapter 5, Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well. God is spirit. Long time. Don't bribe me with a smile. We will say to you after because you have not looked for me. Okay. So, God is spirit, and those who worship him must what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. I know some of you say he didn't even pray. What have we been doing since? Okay, all right. So, so don't, don't let religious spirit come between you and I now. And so if God is spirit, and those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth, then you cannot understand God's communication. If he just says, arise, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen. You cannot reason it here. You have to understand it in the spirit. Do, do you understand what I've just said? Have you ever heard the African addict that says, what an elder sees sitting down? A child cannot see even when he is on top of story building. So when you bring that into your relationship with God and his communication, you have to understand that God is seeing something you are not seeing. Because every time God speaks, we always have a way of downgrading it to the physical. Jesus said to the guys, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They say, we forgot to carry bread. Jesus was talking about their doctrine. He said to the people, you destroy this temple in three days. I will build it. They said, this temple has been built for 46 years. And you now want to build it in three days. And, and then the Holy Spirit went on to say, this, he spake of the temple of his body. You kill me in three days, I will raise it up again. But he didn't get that. So, because of these things, whenever you read from the scriptures, or the Lord is saying to us, we have a new season upon us, you arise. It's not as simple as you think it is. There's something God is trying to pass across. Do, do you understand what I've just said? Okay, so let me help you. Now, that is not to say that I'm focusing only on this word arise, or this, that passage, but I'm trying to use that as a, a conveyor belt for you to understand the principles of God's communication. I call it the decoding divine principle of communication. When God communicates, how do you, you know, how do you decode all the proclamations that he makes? Go to Ecclesiastes. If you have that, quickly give it to us. Ecclesiastes, I will read from the Living Bible. Uh, the Living Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 14. Ecclesiastes 7.14. If you have the living Bible, okay. If not, let's just go. See the way God does things. I said the living Bible, not new living translation. See the way God does things and fall into a lie. Don't fight facts of nature. Don't fight the ways of God. Who can strengthen what he has made crooked? Now, <laughs> see, God is not very is not frivolous. When he says something, you better listen. There were saints in the scriptures 
who had come to a point of understanding God's method of communication. And one of them said, once has he spoken, twice have I heard. That what? The question you should ask yourself is, how can he speak once that you hear twice? The only means by which you can hear the second time is echo. When a person, when a person speaks and there is echo, it repeats what has been said. So this man was in a disposition. He brought himself to a point where he aligned with understanding how God speaks and how the word repeats, how it echoes. I taught it in this church some years ago, and maybe I should say that again in Isaiah 28, uh, 10, when he says, for scriptures, I mean for, uh, for precept must be what? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, okay, okay. My old students are here, so let's go. So, an average believer just say, for precept must be upon precept, lying upon line. But that's not what he says. He says, for precept must what? Uh-huh. Yes. So, don't be in a hurry to leave that passage. If he repeats it, you repeat it. With God, he had few reasons that certain things are repeated. One, whenever God repeats something, Repetition is for emphasis. Number two, whenever he repeats something, the psalmist had a way of saying it. He would say, Sila. It means think about it. It's deeper than you see. It's deeper than you think. So you have to think over it again because he said, line upon line, line upon line. That tells you that there are four lines there and not two lines. It's not precept upon precept, line upon line. It is precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. So, if I were you reading the scriptures, I would not be looking for two lines. I'll be looking for four lines. This is the reason some of us understand the Bible more than the others. Because some of you have read that Jesus, you know, he says, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, right? To open the eyes of the blind. And then you go to say, if you are blind, hallelujah, Jesus can heal you down. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just calm down. Did it occur to you that if Jesus came for that assignment, it had to be universal to all men? That means the whole world will partake in that aspect of his ministry. So what's the percentage of blind people on earth? They're not even 5%. So that could not be what that passage is saying. He's telling you now that there is an aspect of Jesus' ministry that has to deal with human blindness. Where is the first time we lost our sight? Genesis chapter 3. When we exchange the spiritual with the natural, we lost spiritual eyes. So because most of us, again, don't understand. How many of you have read, I don't be like that fornicator? Yeah. Esau, who exchanged his birthright. Where did you see him fornicating now? No, tell me, if you have been a Bible student like all of us, where did you see him fornicating? Somebody said because he was running around the guests of uh, Hittite and Canaanite. Those were the women there. He had to get married anyway. No, 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 no. You see, if you see, when, the, when God charged the children of Israel saying, you committed adultery against me. When they married to people, different people, they were exchanging God for idols. Do you understand? Therefore, the understanding God was bringing to Esau here, concerning Esau, was that every time you change something of spiritual worth, spiritual value for earthly You've committed adultery. So, when you talk about fornication or adultery, it's primarily spiritual. It is the exchange of something of spiritual value for earthly pleasure. That is what it is. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, if that's the case, you better read beyond, to open the eyes of the blind, you have to go back to where we lost sight as soon as we gave up our ability to trust God because the man said to them that serpent said to them if only you can eat this you will be like God in whose image were they made so they were more like God before they ate than after they ate and the moment they gave that out they lost their spiritual sight the ability to see the spirit to connect to the spirit and think like God because before the fall of man man learned 
by revelation. But after the fall of man, man began to learn by discovery. So discovery is actually lower than revelation. Are there people following me? I have a principle. If you don't understand, just shake your head. I will come back. Do you understand what I'm saying? So go back to where we read now, New Living Translation. And then let me show you how to I will connect that with the book of Isaiah. So you see where we read before in, I mean in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 14. See the way God does things and fall into line. See the way God does things and fall into line. And don't fight facts of nature. Now, you have to understand certain things about God. Now, there's a reason I'm teaching it this way. In the Western world, we need to teach to the Westerners. I mean, Westerners by, I mean, you understand what I mean. When you need to teach to the Westerners, they are principally scientific in their approach to life, into everything. If you cannot take it to the lab and prove that there is God, I don't believe there is God. But if you are talking to Africans and maybe Easterners, we are primarily animists in our worldview. There is always a spirit behind everything. If you wanted to cook, you wanted to cook rice and beans or whatever, and you slept off and you woke up, your village people trace you to Regina. I know, I know the people here have been taught properly, so they don't, they don't remember village people. But the other places I've been, the village people are still following them. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so everything for us has something to do. And then we take everything to the realms of praying and fighting and warring. You forgot the fact that you are dealing with a God who works by principles. Which is the problem that most of us are having today. We are dealing with a God who works by principles. He does not necessarily work by... All right. You, look, we've conjured so many saints in the church. I don't think I can even preach something else unless I dismantle some of them. Prayer is the one that moves the hands of God. Or prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Prayer, God already moved before you came here. What's your problem? So when I went into three days fasting, heaven opened. The heaven opened and Jesus came down. Rain the heaven so Lord and prove yourself. He's not proving nothing. The last time he rained the heaven, the heavens opened. Jesus came and his name is called God with us. Emmanuel. Do you remember that? So there are things that we have been taught to believe that you say, look, there are problems that we we'll never solve. Ah, okay, I'm not even going to where I want to go, but it's okay. Do you remember that there is a passage in, in Matthew chapter 17? I said, why could we not cast him out? What did he say? This kind cannot go out but by... And then we begin seven days fasting to cast out one demon. And that's the problem we're having. And then, why, why do we go for 21 days fast, 60 days fast? Why do we do just to move the hands of God? Seriously? God moved before you knew how to fast. He moved before your great-grandparents were born. He moved in Jesus. Okay, so now, Jesus said, this demon, we could not cast him out except by prayer and fasting. We begin to, is that what he said? Okay, you are tempting me to go to that passage now. He says, why could we not cast him out? What did Jesus say? It is because your, of your unbelief. And this kind. Then we switch that answer to mean this kind of demon. Now, if they had said, if Jesus had said, you couldn't cast him out because the demon is very powerful. And this kind cannot go out by prayer and fasting. We know you need fasting and prayer to cast out demons. But no, that's not what he says. He says, why could we not cast him out? He says, because of your unbelief. And this kind of demon or unbelief. Do, do you understand what I'm saying now? 
He's no longer talking about demons now because the demon is irrelevant. He's addressing the reason they couldn't cast him out. And the reason he says is what? Unbelief. And this kind of unbelief cannot go out. But by prayer and fasting. Because in biblical permutation, you know, uh, biblical exegesis, which by the principle by which one passage explains another, you could never justify casting out a demon by fasting to the exclusion of the name of Jesus. According to the scriptures, without fasting, every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. And there's no place that says that you have to fast before they go. So if the name of Jesus, and, and, and the last time I studied this book, the demon that can withstand that name has not been born yet. So if the name of Jesus cannot cast him out, how can your fasting do it? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And what? By the word of what? So if by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the lamb, they couldn't overcome him, how will your fasting overcome it? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? By that, I do not mean fasting is not good. It has its place. If a fasting without prayer has its place, these days, if you are looking at applications or you are looking at these scientists are saying that 36 days fast in a, a quarter or something is good for your system, it rejuvenates and it brings your immunity back and all that. So we know fasting is good. And not only that, fasting has nothing. See, God did not even know you are fasting. How bad can I spoil your religion more than that? God is not aware you are fasting. You know why? You didn't have to fast before he sent Jesus Christ. And when Jesus said he's finished, everything was finished in him. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you need fasting. The reason why you need fasting is to discipline you. Your flesh is not disciplined. And let me tell you, food is foolishness. If you eat all the time, you'll be a foolish person. Your flesh is weak. And it loves to be indulged. But when you starve this, the body, the mind is clear. Your body feels it. And all your faculties are able to focus. That's the reason you fast. It's to discipline yourself, to discipline your body. And let me tell you this. You could be saying one thing over and again. That this, that I can tell you, first hand experience. If you have gone for seven days fasting without food, taking only water, man, you can't even doubt what comes out of your mouth. It's diff you can't doubt what comes out of your mouth. Then your hearing is so tuned, so fine-tuned, you can literally, if you go in, if a tree is communicating, you will hear. Your sense of smell is refined. You pick smell from a distance. And when you get to the seventh day, you don't even have appetite for food anymore. F this same water becomes very sweet. And as you are graduating 10 days, 14 days, you just know that you can live for a long time without food. Taking only water. Uh, some of you are saying, <laughs> I came here for school, don't teach me another thing. I don't like all these people talking weird stuff. I'm just telling you that I'm not against fasting. I fast too. And I probably have fasted more than most of you. Is that all right? I mean, my brother is a pastor will tell you that. That fasting was like second nature to us. So I'm not against fasting. But I'm telling you that in the sense in which we believe, we, we do certain things to the exclusion of the principles behind them. And then we don't make sense out of it. See, I can teach, I can preach you to stand up and be screaming. But I want to, these two days, I want to change your mind. I just want to put something there so that when you get back home, you, you are a new man in your relationship with God. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Okay, so take this, number one. You have to understand that God is meticulous. He is interested in fine details. He's articulate. He's methodical. It's, it's not fastidious. It's not difficult to please or very hard. But God is very intentional about everything. He's intelligent enough to be intentional. He's on purpose. He has a record. It is your job to track his record. 
You must track him down. You must look for his record. He says, notice the way God does things and do what? Fall into a line. You know, those people who put this thing here, they were trying to communicate something. I don't know if you travel a little bit like some of us do, you find out that asking questions are not some of the things you get the best answers to. They just tell you, read the signs. Read the signs. And then without asking anyone, <laughs> you keep going like that. And if you just keep following it, you will arrive at your destination. A typical, no, I don't mean Africans. Ordinarily, most people don't like, they don't like to read. I hear Americans, I've heard them say it over and over, that the best way to hide anything from an American is to put it in a book. But if we Africans, we read a lot. How many of us have ever bought a telephone or something and took time to read? Or you bought a gadget and you read the manual? Less than 000.1%. They just assume they know it. And after that, they say, this thing is not working. Please come and show me this. That's why you have the manual. Shut up. <laughs> but we're not going to read manuals. And, and that's the way, sir. That's the way we relate with God. We fail to understand that reading the manual is the way to understanding how God works. And see, he says, notice the way God does things and fall into line. In 1987, I was fasting and praying. And on the third day, guess what I was fasting for? Because I fasted for every frivolous thing. And I counted that as spiritual exercise. And I told the Lord, I want to have the gift. I want to receive the gift that Finney Dix had. Finney Dix wrote a Bible Spent 50,000 hours to put, you know, that Dix annotated Bible together. And I went to the Lord, and it was a gift. If it's a gift, I don't know why I think God will respect my fasting. And I said, I was not going to stop until I get the Finney Dix anointing. But see, God loves, even if you have, <laughs> sincerity is good. But if you sincerely drink poison, you will sincerely die. <laughs> so, so God was, <laughs> See, my assignment in the rest of my life is to change the way you see God. The third day, God came to me and said, what do you want? I said, I want an anointing life in days. Because the man, if you, if, you, if you were to tap him, he had more than 95% of the Bible he said. And yet, if you ask his wife, and said, the, the wife, he said, you're talking about Phoenix? He said, if you give him three things to buy, she, he will forget two and a half of it. <laughs> that the man's, you know, memory is not very good. But when the gifts, you know, let me say, someone that, came clo that comes closer, I mean, not in that category, is Reverend George. Reverend George, yeah, anyway. If you have stayed with Reverend George, and someone that I'm very familiar with, and um, he looks for scriptures the way you look for scriptures. He will say, uh, Matthew chapter, he will look. But as soon as he holds microphone, Something takes him over, and he the scriptures will just be coming. It's a gift. He actually prayed with me, uh, 1991 or something, 80, 80, 80, 89 or 90 or so. He prayed with me, and I went back. I started quoting scriptures. I was just quoting, scriptures and I said, No, this is not my style. <laughs> so, Finney Dix was like that, and I wanted to know the entire Bible like that. And the Lord said to me, if you want Finney Dix anointing, go and buy his Bible. <laughs> he said, when I needed a Dix Bible, I raised that man up to do that job. If you need his anointing, go and buy his Bible. He said, but if you ask me to anoint you for what I send you to this world for, you will be one in your own category. Is anybody in church? So... God is not so God is very meticulous and he's very intentional. If God just comes to you and says, Arise, that word is loaded. 
And don't assume that you just say, oh, stand up on your feet. You need to know what arise means. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? He's very intentional. When God says something, you know, <laughs> when God says something, he's always loaded. You know, I, I shared with, I don't know whether I shared with us, but he knows about it. When I handed over the last church I pastored, that was exactly 20, over 20 years ago. The last church I pastored. And um, the Lord had told me to live up a church. And the headquarters church, we already had two services. We were running two services. And the hall is, well, it's pretty big. Um, it it, it, it uh, contains about 500 to 600 people. So we started two services. As we started this second service, the Lord told me, go this place. And I got to that place. And immediately I got, oh, hallelujah, and I began church. And eight months down the road, we were already filled up. We were, I mean, we had, we were in our hundreds. And then the Lord said to me, what are you doing here? Now, sometimes when I'm having conversation with God, I even forget that I'm talking about God. See, when you don't understand the way God communicates, you can be very rude, like Jonah. You saw the way and God communicated? It was even rude. And I said, Lord, why will you ask me what am I doing here? Said, you told me to come. I said, yeah, I told you to come here. To do what? I said, I'm doing church. He said, no. When I told you to come here, did it occur to you that you were supposed to report and say, Lord, I am here. What will you have me to do? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, inside this word, arise. There are so many things there. It is like God coming to the man Gideon and he said you mighty man of valor the Lord is with you you are going to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Midianite like one man and then if you are in his shoes what will you say Lord I'm, I'm the last born of my parents if my family is released in Israel and all that we all will say similar things probably no except for holy people here but listen to the way God said it he said to him the Lord is with you. So every other thing you go to hear is predicated on the word, the Lord. The Bible said the Lord is with me like a mighty terrible one. So once the Lord is with you, every other thing falls into place because he that is with God is more than majority. Talk to me somebody. So if he says arise, you need to understand what he is talking about. I, I share that in this place. Let me say it again. God said to Abraham, he said, what before me be prepared? As for me, my covenant is with you. I am your exceeding great reward. Don't worry about anything. When the guy was going to ask, answer God, what was the first thing when he wanted to pray? Oh Lord, if you, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless. Now, you need to understand the way God speaks. He did not say, I am your rewarder. If he says, I am your rewarder, it means he has something to give you, you can demand from. But he says, I am your reward. In other words, I belong to you, so you are as capable as I am. Then you say, what will you give me? What else do you want him to give you? Is there anybody in church? So I'm trying to show you something that God is very intentional. So if the Lord just tells you, arise. It's an intentional statement that is loaded, pregnant with all that you can achieve in the year coming and in the next season of your life. But you need to understand what he's talking about. And I, I hope I can break it down tomorrow. Now, listen to me. When he says that, he gives you this word, then the word is pregnant with everything. Your future is holding. Everything he wants to do is in that statement. You need to see, hear it in that light. Okay, let me come back to Genesis. Am I confusing you? No, you, you? <laughs> Jesus did not always preach for conversion. Sometimes he preached to confuse the people. Because confusion leads to investigation. Investigation leads to discovery. Recovery leads to discovery. <laughs> discovery leads to recovery. Recovery leads to significance. Is that okay? So it's good to be confused sometimes. It will make you read your Bible. So if I'm confusing you, I praise the Lord. Yeah. 
Okay, so God brought everything he created to Adam and to see what he would call it. Whatever Adam named it, that was the name thereof. So, let me give you an example. Lion. What do you think about lion? Wild, yes. Strong. Majestic. Great in the jungle. And, okay, so... Everything you are describing of lion, a, a predator, and all, everything you describe about lion now was preloaded in his name. Everything was loaded in its name. Everything. Okay, so lemon. Lemon, how, how do you feel? Mango, sugar, honey. Salt. Do you see how that everything you know about this and the characteristics, the nature, the formation, the attributes, and all that has to do with that thing is was all preloaded in his name? So if the Lord tells you arise, do you know that he's literally loading a whole season into one statement? And yet we have the power. To give this name. So he gave this out and he says, Arise. So if he says, Arise to you, you then cannot see it because ordinarily, when he brought everything to Adam, he said, This one, it looks like an uh, antelope. Antelope. Uh, this one, lion. No, there was intentionality connected to the names that were given to these animals. So that as soon as you hear their names, their nature, their character, their prophetic destiny, everything was preloaded into it. So when God is speaking to you, it's very intentional. He's preloading some things into that statement. If I were you, I would spend more time on it. Now, this is how I read my Bible. That's the way I understand God, okay? And, and you may think that I'm not a child of God. I'm really born again. <laughs> Number two. Number two things. The second thing I want you to understand is that God wants you to understand him. God does not want to dwell in mystery forever. Now that, because that's another mistake. You assume that because the Lord said, All right, you know, you can never understand God. You, you know, you don't. But there are things that, Deuteronomy 28, uh, 29, 29. The secret things, what? Belongs to what? To the Lord. But the things that are revealed to us are for us. Come on, talk to me. And to our children forever. That what? So look at me. You see, this word, this is why I tell you to understand some things. Read it again. The secret things belong to what? Uh-huh. Stop there. What does it mean to reveal? To open up. To unveil. That means that the things that were revealed to you were sometimes you go secret. Come on, talk to me, somebody. So he's saying. The secret things belong to the Lord, but he chooses to reveal some of them so that you and your sons may do. But as soon as you do that, then he reveals more. So God doesn't want, God wants to be understood. He wants, he wants you to know him. He wants you to understand him. Give me, a, give me another passage. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. And then after that, you give me uh, Psalm 25, verse 14. Let's see. Uh, uh, Hosea chapter 3. Then shall we know, read it with me, if we what? Follow on what? To know. You know when you follow on to know. In other words, there is no end to knowing, but you can always know more. Do, do you understand what I've just said? You need to come to the point where you are not satisfied with what you know, but you want to know more. You know, uh, something happened to me, uh, to us. We had an issue with, uh, my wife had some health issues in the last three and a half years, and we've been going through a lot. And um, I've known her for 40 years. We've been married for a few out of those years, 35 of it. There were some revelations of her that I saw this year that I have never known before. I said to her, if they told me that you are like this, I will, I will curse the person. I will say it's not true. 
He said, hey, you know that the, now those things are never new until she was very low in health. And I didn't know that. I did not know that when you are in a particular point. I would say, look, everything that we have, every, whatever we need to dispose of to make you all right will be this. Okay, you have done everything. I'm still not all right. Then something hit me that when a person wants to be all right, Job said, I mean, Satan told, told God, he said, all that a man has, he will give what? For his life. Oh, if a man needs to be all right and he is not, Telling the person you spend everything on that doesn't make sense. Because the goal is not spending, the goal is to be alright. And I had to live with this woman for 35 years to understand that, that revelation. And then I began to see, you see, the older we are getting, the more I'm seeing my mother in my wife. Some of the tricks that my mother will play, I see my wife playing the tricks. <laughs> and then, so I, so I began to see that. So I sat down. One day, I was talking, we were laughing. I said, if they told me that this part of you existed, I would say it doesn't. But I would never have discovered that if we were not together for 35 years. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I, don't, I didn't understand God to this dimension all along but i kept growing then shall we know if we follow on to know if you listen to me two years ago don't just hold that tip because i may have revised my syllabus and so i used to want especially you younger generation be careful when you follow a man follow him closely enough to know when he revises his syllabus don't hold me to what I said 15 years ago, 20 years. That's too long a time. I'm growing. I'm following him to know. Is anybody in church? Yeah. Then shall we know if we follow on to know. One of the biggest mistakes our fathers made was that when they were teaching us when we were coming up, they told us that don't we or anyone bring anything different from what we taught you. Now they themselves are saying they're in revolution yes. and they cannot say it. Even when they say it, they are protesting against them. Yes, Members of your youth today, they are protesting against some of the big fathers who taught them what they knew because the fathers told them that though we or anybody bring another one, let them be accursed. You can't do that because as far as God is concerned, you need to understand that he has secrets and he wants you to understand those secrets. But you can only understand when you follow on to know. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, your whole life, the plan of God you thought you know in your life, is unveiling. It is not a plain sheet. It's not like building plan. It's a scroll. All you may know will be the day you got married. Every other trouble after that, you won't know. You think if God had opened the entire thing and told Joseph, you are going to be a king, you are going to be a prime minister, but first of all, you will go into the pit and they're going to sell you be a slave boy. And after that, <laughs> Madame Potiphar is waiting. Oh my God. When you see Madame, you will understand. And then God showed her, and then he's going to end up in prison. What do you think yourself will do? He said, Lord, no, we, I can live without being a prime minister. Because sometimes, you see, we, we don't mind suffering, punishment for whatever we've done wrong. But when they lie against you, and you have to suffer, and your reputation has to suffer, that one is painful. So when you if so God is smart enough not to show you everything, so He will open the scroll and you say, "I'm going to be a leader." He told the Father, "I say I saw the sheep and the sad, they move everything about that." He said, "You mean you are going to be a leader?" And everybody was there. God said, "Don't worry." And then the next time they caught him, pop! The first thing those guys who dropped him in the in, inside the well said, "Let us see what will become of his dream." And then he heard it that. Your dream ends here. And they drop inside the well. So you can see that as far as God is concerned, you only get to know as you follow on to know. So where you are now does not define where you're going to be. It's a preparatory stage. If the Lord has put in his heart and said, let us arise, there's something bigger than what you have gone through. Your yesterday no longer exists. Stop money about that. Stop hiding your face. Stop hiding behind one finger. It no longer exists. 
Now he says, arise. Something is coming ahead of you. Can I hear it loud? Amen. Yeah. Okay, give me another passage before, we, before I leave there. Um, Psalm, is that, did I say Psalm 25? Verse 14. Can you do that? All right, let's see. Psalm 25. Okay, read it, everybody. The secret of the Lord. Uh huh. What do you understand by that? God has secrets and he shows them to some people. He shows them to some people. Technically, we know that the glory of God, the scripture says that the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. And that's the glory we behold. We get transformed from whatever glory we are to the glory that is in Jesus. Correct? When Moses was saying, Lord, I want to see. I want to see you. That prayer actually was answered. <laughs> you, you know it was answered? It wasn't answered in the Old Testament because what God showed him was the backside. You remember that God said, I will lay my hands, you will see my backside. As a matter of fact, all, almost all Bible scholars agreed that it was that encounter that God said, I will show you the backside that, that caused him to see what happened from Genesis to Deuteronomy. He saw the backside. He saw where God has been. But it was when he met with Jesus on, t on the Mount of Transfiguration on Mount Tabor that he saw Jesus. Then he knew that the promised land was not a piece of real estate. It was a person. Yeah. Jesus was the promised land. It was a Sabbath of God. That the Sabbath was not a day. It was a person. The promised land was not, was not a land, a palace where they're fighting. It was a person. Then he saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he saw that. The glory of God hiding. God keeping secret with some men. My question to you is this. Do you know that we don't understand God to the same dimension? And we will never understand God to the same dimension. The reason we can't is because there are some people that have decided to fear the Lord enough that he can trust them with his secrets. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? We were talking about pastor yesterday. There were things that I shared with him that there was nobody who heard it from my mouth. Only himself. He would sneak into church. I'm in the library. He would come and practice. He plays keyboard. He would come and practice trumpet. He would practice bass guitar. He would, sometimes he would just know. He knows because he lives in my brother. He lived in my brother. So he would come into the... He knew I was in the office. And then he said, I just wanted to greet you, sir. I said, sit down. I will share some secrets with him. He heard those things. He knew those things. Others did not. And then there were big people those days, senior, those who were senior pastors to him. He was playing keyboard. Some of those people are not doing fine in the Lord. He is on fire. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to volunteer my secret to you until you get to that level of relationship. A pastor had followed me for 34 years now, or 35 years. And you know what? It was when it clocked 30 years of following me, I told him certain secrets. He stood there and said, sir, you mean this is your history? I never knew anything about that. He said, thank you for trusting me with this. I didn't know your background. I didn't know this much. He said, I have learned that there are secrets people will never know until after 30 years. There is power in consistency. There is power in hanging in there and pushing through and following through and following on to know the secret of the Lord. God doesn't want to dwell in secret forever. He wants you to follow. He wants you to keep pressing in, pressing in until that thing comes out. Why would somebody spend one hour with me and go away with somebody who came in for five minutes meeting? It would be unjust. And God, if you know anything about attributes of God, he's a God of justice. And that is why, see, God is not partial. And because God is not partial towards everyone, it will be wrong for him to treat you. Sir, I don't know whether you heard this before. They say, you say, you, we ought to treat as believers, we should treat all men equally. If you treat men, all men equally, how do you reward lo loyalty? How, how, 
how are you going to reward loyalty if I treat all men equally? As I speak to you here, there are churches where I should have been this weekend in, in the U.S. But I'm not going to give that up for this because this one is almost 30 years in making. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. I will cancel, I will stop your meetings for his because he has been there when you were not. You just came. So I make new friends, but I cherish the old ones. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, pick this point. God is never casual about anything. Even when the statement appears casual to you, he's not casual. He's not casual. Let me quickly give you this. Did you remember what happened to this guy the other time? Arise, Peter. Kill and eat. And he repeated it three times. Did he eat? But you see, God is not casual about anything. Because before he came to tell Peter, rise up, kill and eat, he had already arrested Paul, Saul of Tarsus, on the way. But it is not in God's nature to just pick anybody and dump the old one. He will give you the first right of refusal. So he offered this to Peter. I said, will you, will you eat anything I give you? He said, no, I've never. He said, stand up, eat now. He said, no. The second time, he said, I'm sure there was dialogue in heaven. He said, leave him alone. He said, he's not hungry. He said, no, send him. Go back. Hey, yes, go back. Go back. It is against natural justice to let this guy not to give him opportunity to eat. Let him eat. He came back again. And, and, and he said, I won't eat. He said, you don't know him more than me. I, I, I'm asking you. I order you. And Jesus must have been there. I said, please. I died for this crazy guy. This guy gave me a tough time. I endure with him. I endure with him. One more time. One more time. Send the angel to go back there. And then he came and he said, I told you the first time you didn't hear. Second time you won't hear. The third one I said, I have never eaten anything unclean. <laughs> Jesus said, Don't turn to me. <laughs> I'm okay. We found one already. That one, he will eat turtles, he will eat monkeys, he will eat cockroaches. Whatever you give him, Paul, Paul will eat. He, he said, he said, we found somebody already. But I needed to give him opportunity if he will eat. Now that you refuse to eat, Paul. I said, Apostle, since you don't know how to eat, you go to the Jews. They are the ones that will kill you anyway, but go to them. <laughs> and you, since you can eat anything, go to those who will magnify your ministry. God is very intentional. If God tells you something, you better believe that he knows what he's talking about and he's intentional about it. You know, let me give you a very, very funny story before I move to the next one. And then, this, all these are introduction to what I want to say. Okay, so something happened to me. I saw a house I wanted to buy. I loved the house. It was okay. There was room for expansion. All kinds of things. Oh my God, I love it. So I took my wife there, took my family there, and I said, what do you see? Oh, And with this, I said, Lord, now we like this house. We're interested. We're going to buy it. And they told me the price. So I went to pray. And I said, Lord, now let's get something straight. I don't like argument. Let's get it straight. It will be against justice. Not to show me where to get the money to pay for it. So, if you're going to, I'm not, I'm not saying, to, you don't have to say anything. Whatever you say will be used against you. <laughs> In the court of my prayers, I'm going to quote you back again. So, you don't have to say anything. But if you're going to say something, show me where to get the money. In Jesus' name. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, do you think it's unfair? You are telling me it would be unfair not to show you the money. I said, yes, sir. He said, do you think it's unfair if I don't show you the money? I said, very unfair. Next. And, um, and the Lord said, why do you think it's unfair? I said, you know the answers. Just say what you want to say. And then God used the same word unfairness to answer me. He said, what if I think it is unfair for you to spend that kind of money on a house? What if I think what is fair is for someone to build a house and give you the keys? I said, yeah, yeah, that one is fair. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of you will say, Is this man really a man of God? 
That's how my father, that's how we communicate. So every word that emanates from God it contains the full intention of his thought, backed by his power. Everything there's look, he's put a lot of thoughts into it. What you have not yet even thought about. I mean, he's thought about it, he's finished it, and he had also thought about what happens from eternity. So when he says a word, it's bigger than what you think. And when I begin to show you this verse alone, Isaiah 61 and 2, when I show you some principles there, you're going to know that God does, is not flippant. It's not frivolous. It's not trivial. God speaks. He says what he means and means what he says. Every word that comes up contains his full thought and backed by the power of his word. He's intentional. Number, whatever number it is. He sets rule for everything. How things should be done. He respects his laid down protocols. And this is the flip side of most children of God. We are serial violators of divine protocols. We are serial violators. A lot of us go to places that God won't go and you ask him to protect you. And there are things that we even say that God doesn't... If you don't... See... How many of you have prayed and you don't know whether God has answered or not? Because you cannot pray. You are not specific. Look at some of the foolish prayers we pray. Father, we, as we are gathered here, we ask you to come and be with us. Did you not say where two or three are gathered? I am already there. So how is he supposed to answer that prayer? Lord, as we are going today, we ask you to go with us. He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. How is he supposed to answer that? There are many things that God cannot do. No, I get the young man who said what God cannot do does not exist. I understand what he's trying to say. God has all power, right? Let me believe that's what they're saying. He's, he has all the power. He can do everything. But listen to me. One of the things God cannot do is for him to do what he gave you to do. If you are married today, there's supposed to be one virgin birth. That happened 2,000 years ago. He's not going to conceive your wife. You know, it's only in Africa that... The guy just delivered, the wife just delivered six months ago. He's, he's pregnant again. He said, ah, bro, your wife is pregnant. He said, it's, it's God. <laughs> God call. God me. <laughs> I mean, you, you get the message. It's, it's God. In Africa, God does everything for us. So, so you, you see, God will never do what he has assigned to you. If you will not eat, he won't put food in your mouth. If you won't go to the toilet, you will mess up. He won't come to do that for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? The other thing God cannot do, he can't unlove you. He has already loved you. The token of his love is he gave his son. Now, he cannot recall Jesus and say, okay, let us unlove him. He already loves you. So all these things, I don't know what I've done. I don't know why God is it. He loves you. You may have done some, some stupid things that you shouldn't have done. God loves you, stupid. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, but he loves you all the same. So that's the way God does it. But he respects protocol. And most of us are asking God to violate his protocols. It's the reason you don't get results. I will show you that this arise gives you some responsibility. That's right. If you are going to say, it's, you arise. It's not just uh, uh, arise and shine the glory of the Lord. It, it comes with responsibility. I, I'll show you when we get there. So you need to understand that you can't violate. The last time, see, God respects protocol. The last time, Jesus was in the temple. And then we told the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple and asked him to jump down. What did Jesus say? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You know why? Jesus realized that, he recognized that on earth there is the law of gravity. And when we read this temple thing, sir, what we read is that the Lord is in his holy temple. He didn't say the Lord is in his pinnacle. <laughs> if he had said the Lord is in his holy pinnacle, <laughs> we know that you can jump down from there. He's inside the temple. What are you doing on the pinnacle? And you are not asking... <laughs> And you are saying, Lord, I want to jump down from Benaku. I hope your angels are there. Well, your whole back is going to be scattered. 
You cannot see. God, God, you see, most Christians are serial violators of divine protocols. You just don't know how to obey simple rules when you come to God. No, so here we are. You are asking God to do something he has asked you to do. But God, imagine a child of God who decides to go up there without harness, without any rope, nothing to sustain him there. And you ask God to suspend gravity. So God will have had to kill millions. All the planes that are flying around the world now. He will, once he suspends uh, gravity, every one of them will fall. The war pieces, the chairs will be flying, cars will be flying. So you want God to destroy the air for one foolish child of God? No, he will leave you so that you can come up to him. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So you need to understand that even when you are dealing with God, if he says stand up and go and you sit, your location, your allocation, your provision has shifted base. There are some of you that are here that God has been speaking to you to go back to Nigeria. You are minding God. The way they are kidnapping people. Go back to Ghana and be shortly. You said, no, Lord. Or God told you, live here and go to Calgary. Or he told you, go to this place or something. There's some of you hearing something and God is saying, arise and do something. And then you are there doing your debate. God is not going to force you. He won't violate it. But at the end of the day, you will not have an answered prayers. Not because God hasn't answered, but he, he has shown you where your allocation is. And you chose to stay behind. Do you understand what I'm saying? I have a couple of minutes more before we pray. He said to Elijah, Arise, go to the brook Kerith. Go now. When you get there, there will be water, and I will supply bread. He got there, and then he and the ravens were coming, feeding him. Ravens are not that big, so they won't come with too much bread. But whatever it is, it was God who was providing. And then one day he woke up, the ravens wasn't coming, the brook was dried. It's time. You see, now let me to, let me show you some principles there. The ravens were supernatural, but the brook was natural. That's God using both natural and supernatural means. See, children of God, there are things that can be solved naturally that you don't need prayer to solve. I, I told you, you remember uh, one of these people who had his, uh, uh, he got married in our church those days and the husband was in another city a one hour flight away from where we were so we go by the road and bad roads 12 hours or something and 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 she was here and every day she's coming to me daddy please pray pray for me what is the problem say there's no child uh, since we got married what about your husband he's been posted to <laughs> so what am i supposed to do something tells me that it's not prayer you want he said, just pray so that God will, okay. Ah, let's pray. Hallelujah. Thus says the Lord. Go and meet your husband, you'll get pregnant. <laughs> Amen. For the light, your light is come. Arise and go. <laughs> just arise and go. I had to call the man. I said, come over. And then he, he arrived. I said, I order you to go for your vacation. Take your three weeks or one month vacation. Now, enter into that room with your wife. Don't come out again. <laughs> they had to go back to hospital to stop to do family planning. God doesn't violate his rules. I want you to wake up and say to yourself, one pastor told me, he said, do you know that I have not received an answer prayers? I can't point to something God has answered for me in the last 17 years. I say because you are a serial violator. You are a serial violator of divine protocols. God has laid down principles you are not cooperating. God had to use the supernatural and the natural means to bring food to Elijah. Then one day when the brook dried and the raven did come, God said, go to Zarephath now. I have there commanded a widow to feed you. Go now! Because at the time I've calculated, factored in how many hours you track from here to that place. And I know that that woman will be guarding sticks ready to go home. If you miss it, the token I have given you. If the woman went home, tracing her will be difficult. So cooperation, hearing and moving immediately. What you call spontaneity. You hear and you obey immediately. 
Why you are big is difficult in should lie, should I not? If you let that woman leave, you're going to be hungry. Go now. Understanding that when God says a thing, his full thoughts have been backed in. He's figured everything out for you. You know, in this part of the world, senior military officers call the younger ones to debate, to ask questions. We have this operation, what do you think? What do you think? On the average, the officers have been trained to make decisions for the younger ones. And then you don't say no, sir. In the military, it's always yes, sir. Yes, sir. I saw one of them one day say, go post this letter for me, and I want to receive the, uh, the reply tomorrow. He said, yes, sir. It is done. You receive it. He had not even arrived at the post office yet. So, I saw, we understand how these military things work. God wants to act as your commander. He has done all the planning for you. If he gives you a word, it's your job to move. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Well, uh, the last thing I'm going to say here, and uh, maybe tomorrow we, we, we can continue from there, is that although God is not a respecter of persons, he respects his principles. This is the reason you find that the richest people in the world are not Christians. Christians will pray, the unbelievers will walk by principles. They walk by principles. They just walk, they walk, they walk on that principles. They use that, they apply those principles. Why are they so wise? They took time out to find out how things work. You find out how things work and walk them. When the scripture, do you, I can guarantee you that the richest man in Africa, who is a Nigerian, has not read that portion of the Bible that says in, in um, Proverbs chapter 6. It says, uh, what? Go to the ant and there is oh you sluggard. And he says what? A little sleep, a little slumber, and your want will do what? Will come like what? An armed man. Will look like a traveler who is well armed coming to your home. I guarantee you that man has not read that. But he understood that principle. I think I shared the story in this church. I don't know whether it's this church or something. But I've shared this story where he, you know, he noticed that the man said he noticed that his uh, security man was always sleeping at night. So he will wake up in the night. I mean, he's out by 2 a.m. He's calling China. He's calling Australia. He's talking to them. I say, oh, look, I heard about this container. How about this and all that. And his security man, who ought to be protecting him, guarding him, will be sleeping. So he said to himself one day, I think something is wrong. I'm paying this man to guide him, but I'm the one guiding the guy. So during one of the Muslim festivals, the uh, Salah break, he called him, he said, I have a gift for you. He gave him three million naira. Then, that was a lot of money. He gave him three million naira, and he said to him, go and celebrate with your family. Two days after that, he observed the man had returned to work, no more sleep at night. Five days after, the man was still not sleeping. One week, the man was no longer sleeping. So he invited him, he said, I'm worried for you. Every night I come here, you were always sleeping. But the last one week, you have not been sleeping. In, at night, what happened? What's happening? Let's solve the problem together. He said to him, Oga, the money you gave me didn't allow me to sleep. <laughs> he said to him, I'm awake every night thinking of how to invest this money to better my life. He said, because I've not come up with an idea that I can spend this money on to make my life better, I can't afford to sleep. So the man went ahead. There are two things that came out of it. Number one, the man did not have money and became a gate man because he slept too much. The second thing is, the more money you have, the less sleep. If you want to make more money, the less sleep you will. Because while men sleep, the enemy will so tears. That's when you bring out your strategies. You need to begin to create time to sit down and put your thoughts together. God is intentional about you. Of all the cities who could be in the whole of this Canada, you are here. Of all the nations on earth you could have been, you are here. Of everywhere you could have been, all the locations you could have been outside of this church tonight, this is where you are. You think it's an accident? 
God is intentional about you. God is intentional about you. God is giving you instructions. And let me tell you something God told me. Can I give you that and I pray with you? You are going to hear some things you've never heard before. You are going to hear God speaking to you. You are going to hear God challenging you and asking you to take certain steps that you never even thought of. People have invested in certain things that failed. You are going to hear God saying, go into that field. Always remember that his full intentions and plans have been put into that thought. I'm praying for you tonight. Every word of the Lord to you will come to pass. I speak into your life tonight that you will hear supernaturally. You will understand accurately. You will feel the spiritual more than you have ever felt before. You will hear the inaudible more than you have ever heard before. The word of the Lord, the voice of God will come to you with clarity. Today, I announce a new season on your life. The days of your tears are gone. The days of of your complaints are gone. I announce a new season. In this new season, you will have no regrets. In this new season, you will hear the word of the Lord. The spirit of God will guide you into all truth. I speak into your life that tonight, you'll be caught up with the spirit of revelation. You will never trivialize your relationship with God anymore. I speak to you today to begin to arise in your high places. Begin to go to your high places. Begin to step into the purpose of God. And I pray today that there is transformation. You have a new way of thinking. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That those childhood dreams that you've heard, today is the beginning of fulfillment. Yeah. Those things God told you some years ago, you thought I'd been forgotten, today is the beginning of execution. Yeah. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Yeah. Amen.